my name's Neil, I'm 31 years old, sitting on a Jackson lifeguard, and this is Fred, our Nissan NFO1 forklift. I mean, Fred, Fred has a place in my heart, and I hope the viewers at home as well, in their hearts too. Um, it seems to be the sort of thing, I've never named any of my vehicles, and I never will, they're just, they're cars to me. They're not called like Steve or Jenny or anything else, it's just a vehicle, I don't get that attached to them. Fred on the other hand, uh, so he's been here long before I started with the company and he'll be here long after I'm gone as well. Um, I don't fully un appreciate or understand the, the history of him. I don't know who gave him the name Fred. I feel like it was on his birth certificate. He has been in the fleet for at least 20 years and he was second hand when our company got him. Probably more like 25 years. So he's been around a long time. I imagine he would have been built in the late 80s or early 90s, somewhere around that time, just based on the color scheme and the engine and everything. Uh, it's really hard to find information on them because they made them for so long with the same engine and, and same running gear. Everyone loves Fred. Fred's really easy to drive. Uh, Fred is, yeah, he, he has the smallest lift capacity and height, but very narrow, super simple to drive. Anyone can get on there, just really easy to operate. Um, prior to driving Fred, I've driven forklifts before, I've never had a job where I'm required to drive forklifts all the time, but it's, you know, I've used forklifts for lifting up cars to pull engines out of them or, you know, scrapping shells and that kind of thing, so uh, in the current role that I'm in, I don't, it's not my job to drive any of the forklifts, but I'll drive them fairly regularly, uh, especially if some of the other guys in the stores are busy doing other things or if a truck needs unloading. Oh, what's... So the producer's given me a list of uh, Fred J Forklift facts that I can read out for you. So this is for anyone who's interested in the technical aspect. So Fred is a Nissan NF01 M10 forklift. I don't actually know what that means, but it's a model that's quite common. Uh, when I googled it, there were loads of them for sale in the Middle East, uh, where they love this uh, model of forklift. He has a one ton lift capacity, uh, one metric ton, so a thousand kgs and a three meter maximum lift height. Weirdly enough, yeah, Fred weighs 1.185 tons, so he's, he's a pretty small boy, and most of that's concentrated at the rear in the counterweight that we have, so he's about a ton and he can lift a ton, which is pretty good. I mean, he, he benches his own weight, and it's, it's not too bad, but he, he's done it for 25 years. I'll give him some credit there. You're probably familiar with Nissan and Datsun. Originally Datsun that became Nissan at some point in the 80s. A lot of their commercial vehicles were still called Datsuns or powered with them. So Fred has a Datsun pushrod, four cylinder dedicated LPG uh, J15 engine. So 1.5 litre, I think bore and stroke are about 77, 78 mil. So basically a square engine design. Decent amount of torque for a small engine, not very high revving, but you don't really want that with a forklift either, just low revving torque, can run all day, super reliable. Although one day someone was driving him and he drove over a plastic bag and it floated up, got caught on his radiator fan, spun around, cut his own radiator hose, his coolant linked everywhere, and, um, and Fred was out of action for, <laughs> for a couple of days. We had to get some new hoses for him. So he's a, he's a solid unit, but a, a single plastic bag caused his downfall, uh, but he's back in action now. Difference with Fred compared to a lot of modern forklifts is newer forklifts might have a forward and reverse. They're not really automatic, but they just have a forward reverse single gear, or they might have a two-speed or similar. Fred is completely manual, so he has a clutch, a two-speed gearbox, so a, a low and a high, and also a forward and reverse, so it's all mechanical. There's no electronic shifting between there, just everything with the levers that you see on the right here. So very mechanical, very basic, very simple. And it also means you have a two-speed reverse. So kind of like a super shift Mirage or similar, the high and the low. Being a conventional forklift rear steering as well. So really good for tight spots. If we need to get a forklift, we'll always choose Fred unless it's a very high load or unless it's an extremely heavy load. Fred's the guy that, the forklift that gets chosen first because he's just so maneuverable and, and so easy to drive so um, yeah that probably concludes the facts for Fred. Yeah. My family originally from Fiji but I was born in New Zealand in a very, uh, how do we say that, not very diverse small town so it was interesting but we went to Fiji numerous times, I think six or seven times by the time I was 10 years old and in some ways perhaps that influenced my interest in cars as well because back then in Fiji the cars were all 80s Jap and 70s and 80s Japanese cars. The taxis were all 
Glorias and old Laurels, Mark IIs, that kind of thing. They all had fender mirrors and hubcaps and two-tone and wood grain and everything. And I love that kind of stuff. But at that time in New Zealand, when those cars came in, people would bin all of that stuff. They'd put on, in my opinion, really terrible wheels. But we're seeing a renaissance of that sort of style where now people will go out of their way to buy fender mirrors to put on the car or they want that classic original kind of look, which is what I've always liked. And that was just what people drove because newer cars were expensive, imports were really expensive. I think in the 90s when a, like a Mitsubishi Pajero in New Zealand was 20 grand, in Fiji it was like $100,000. The prime minister in Fiji drove a Pajero, so a lot of people from Fiji, they come over and like a Pajero or a Prado is a really aspirational vehicle. So when they come here and they're a quarter the price of what they are in Fiji, they just buy them straight away because It'll be like me driving a BMW 730i L diesel, which is what the Prime Minister has, for like 10 grand if I went to Germany, for example. Like, I've got a better car than the Prime Minister, and it's cheap. So that's, yeah, and in, in Fiji, you, you sort of, because parts are expensive and people generally learn on the fly and learn how to look after cars, you'll find that cars that in other countries might have been scrapped they're still on the road 20 or 30 years later. There are a lot of diesel conversions. Uh, my granddad had a Mazda 929 Legato, I think it was, with the stacked headlights, uh, with an LD28 in it. And a great story in our family was, for many years he drove it around and it had a four-speed knob on the shifter. Uh, but one day he wrong-slotted third gear and hooked fifth, and he'd had the car for about two years. And he called my parents in New Zealand he called all of his children as well to explain what he'd found, which was the fifth gear on his car. Uh, and, and this is a man who would shift from first into second into third at like 700 RPM. So the, the thing's clunging along for maximum economy. So when he discovered fifth gear, he told all of his children about it and we heard about it. So that was a, that was a big day in my family. It went from a four speed to a five speed. The LD28 is, it represents a pinnacle of six cylinder non-cross flow diesel propulsion. It's economical, and I've seen LD28s in Fiji in all manner of cars. Uh, early Holden station wagons, 202 out, LD28 in. I saw a Valiant Charger that had the 265 removed and scrapped to put an LD28 into it as well. So, uh, yeah, over there it's just Fiji is more about the look. If you could have a car that looks fast but is actually really slow and economical, you've won at life. My vehicle history, I got my license as soon as I was able to, which is when I was 15 years old and at high school. I first learnt to drive when we lived in the South Island uh, on my dad's lap. We had a LPG powered, similar to Fred over here, dedicated LPG Toyota Corona wagon, which had like 600,000 Ks on the clock and it would leak and the fuel gauge didn't work so you just have to kind of guess. After that, when we moved to Auckland, I bought a 1989 Honda Accord. Uh, New Zealand new, pink, pop-up headlights, leather interior, a radio where you couldn't actually see the readout so I had to get a radio manually to use it to listen to it to tune the radio in my car. But sometimes the battery would disconnect itself and then I'd lose the stations and I didn't know what to do. Uh, but I drove around in that for a while. I think I had that car for about six months i sold it to a guy named osama uh, no relation and then i bought sight unseen a parallel imported singaporean destined holden vp calais with an opal 2.6 liter straight six which is not the engine they should come with and it had a slipping transmission and i drove it home at night but if i manually shifted it the transmission would work properly in it so i ended up pulling the trans out and learning a bit about them and fixing it so it worked well. I drove that for a while but I also had no money so I ended up selling that to a guy who took the leather interior out of it and scrapped the rest of it. And I bought a DA6 Honda Integra, two-door, uh, VTEC. Unlike everyone else at school who modified their cars, mine was completely standard. Drove around in that for maybe about six months to a year. And then afterwards I worked with my cousin. He had a Z31 Nissan 300ZX. Uh, VG30 non-turbo so out of two wrecked cars he built one and I drove that around for a bit and that was really cool it was manual they weren't worth much at the time I think I sold it for maybe four grand things just kind of went a bit crazy I owned an 82 Subaru Leon GLF5 coupe uh, all of the cars that I've had none of them are particularly fast they're just a little bit different um, something that I like my driving style is I'm not really interested in speed so much <laughs> economical although some of the other cars I've had are the complete opposite of that uh, so I had the Subaru coupe I had 
Uh, I bought a Corona GTR, which is a four-door sedan, but had the 3S GE, basically a Toyota MR2 engine, for $68, which was the cost of registration. I've had loads of different cars, Rover SD1s, I had a 454 powered manual big block Chevrolet Blazer, which was not economical. Yeah, <laughs> what sort of engine did it have? Big block, 454 cubes, uh, it was a piece of shit, and uh, driving it home, the front drive shaft let go. Um, so I ran it in rear wheel drive only. I had a Citroen 2CV left hand drive Charleston for a bit, which is still my favourite car I've ever owned. I would buy another 2CV in a heartbeat. Uh, slow but fun. I had a couple of Jaguars, XJ40s, Series 1s and 2s, uh, a Hillman Superminx through which I met uh, a good friend of mine that I sold, so Superminx for a while, a Mark 1 Ford Transit bullet nose camper with a dually 9 inch rear end and a Falcon 6 cylinder in it. I've probably owned 70 or 80 in my life so far. Uh, and at the, my worst, I probably had about 12 or 13, so a whole bunch of different cars. But yeah, favourite car that I've had was definitely the Citroen 2CV. Generally try and do my own work on them. I still have a Triumph 2.5 Pi, which is a mechanically injected straight six powered British car. Uh, British because they're terrible. They're, you have to work on them all the time. Uh, they have all sorts of foibles and issues, but it's kind of fun. I like it because it's a little bit different. It's not that fast. It's just kind of what I know now. And uh, yeah, so I hope to, I'll hang on to that and uh, hopefully cut down on the number of cars that I have and maybe fix that up and drive around and enjoy it. And that's not even getting onto the bikes either. So. Yeah. so the industry that I'm in, the electrical industry, there's a whole, you know, actual electrical contracting, the trade, uh, design, implementation, wholesaling, everything else. So a big part of the electrical industry and it being very masculine and everything else is uh, it's mainly dominated by men and they often drive, in my opinion, ridiculously over the top vehicles like big utes. You might get a sales rep that drives a Ford Ranger, for example, which I feel is a completely pointless vehicle driven by unsavory characters who are compensating for their own masculinity who can't park them. So I absolutely detest them uh, unless I see a ute that's actually being used as a ute, being loaded up, but that's few and far between. So I, I'm not a fan, I just drive a Corolla wagon, which I love, which is small and easy to maneuver and park and everything. But I don't need a ute for just me driving around. I have probably towed more and put more in the back of the Corolla wagon than most people have in their lifted double cab utes. So yeah, not a fan of the utes. The utes that I've owned have always been more practical, not really interested in the appearance. Kind of like the cars as well where, again, my 2CV, like interesting weird car, not very fast, quirky, but it's just fun to drive and, and, and that's sort of the point of them. Um, with forklifts as well, we do have some newer forklifts and there are certain brands as well, but with, I think like a lot of things, some of the newer forklifts have a lot of electrical controls. There's a lot to go wrong with them. Uh, they're quite expensive to fix and repair, whereas this guy is, we, we have a maintenance schedule, they come in and just do the servicing and that kind of thing, but anything else we can repair ourselves, it's just really simple to work on. Yeah, this is a forklift that anyone can service, very basic. I imagine if you go to like forklift maintenance training and you're a forklift maintenance apprentice, this is the kind of thing that they'd teach you about. Uh, so it's, yeah, the industry's progressed and things are nicer, more comfortable, often a lot bigger but I yeah they don't necessarily need to be a lot bigger I think it's better just to pick something right for the job and yeah that's where having a small forklift that's really maneuverable is is actually really handy if anything happens there's always a forklift involved you look at like a military deployment there are forklifts moving bits and pieces around warehousing storage food production it, you name it if you need to move things efficiently smoothly forklifts are always there and I think there's always been a stigma about forklift operators or forklift enthusiasts that they basically are quite loose units that hoon around on forklifts and are unsafe and do all sorts of dodgy things and there is a little there's an element of that but I think similar to trucks and truck drivers as well you think of anything that you have for example the enclosure I'm sitting on or the parts used to build this building at some point in time a forklift has probably transported that uh, to get it there so the humble forklift a really unsung hero and I think Fred epitomizes that with his you know he's he's a real battler he he didn't ask for this he was quite flattered to be involved in this video um, he'd probably just prefer to be doing general forking duties uh, on a Sunday on his day off 
we owe a lot to the forklift. Um, and I, th I, th I think they deserve our respect. But yeah, I'm Neil and uh, that was Fred the Forklift. Thank you.